I'm Jun Nishimura, connecting from Japan. Uh, I'm very happy to chair this session after Toby. And the uh, next speaker is Simon Katara from Syracuse, and he's going to tell us about chiral lattice theories from Stargard fermions, please. Okay, thank you, Jun. Yeah, so I'm very happy to be here uh, this morning or this evening, wherever you are coming, connecting in from. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some recent work on chiral lattice gauge theories. Um, oops, now I just wake this computer up. There we go. So here's an outline of what, what I'd like to talk about. So I'll have a very brief introduction to why uh, chiral lattice fermions are something we might be interested in and why they've proven so difficult uh, over now several decades of, of efforts of, of work within the lattice gauge theory community. Uh, I'll talk about a key component of the uh, a proposal I'm, uh, I'm putting forward today, which is the use of so-called reduced staggered fermions. I'll talk in general about symmetric mass generation, particularly in the context of reduced staggered fermions. Uh, and so quite a bit of work has already happened in the case of vector-like theories over the last few years. And so you can think of what I'm talking about today as a sort of a, a generalization of those approaches to target theories, which are chiral in the continuum limit. Um, one of the key features uh, of the, the new work is the realization of, a, of an anomaly that occurs for staggered fermions, and I'll talk about that. And that anomaly is connected in to the entire problem of whether you can formulate a chiral gauge theory or not. Uh, so it's, this is a fairly recent uh, uh, sort of piece of work. Uh, it, it's happened within the condensed matter community, but it's also uh, very much a, a current topic in mathematical physics. So there are certain new discrete anomalies that have been discovered and they're very relevant for this discussion. Anyway, then I'll get on to talking about the particular chiral fermion proposal I, I want to bring forward today. And, and, this, and, and that boils down to the structure of a certain new cow interactions that you have to add into the theory uh, to gap out the states that you don't want. And so we'll borrow uh, so, some of those, the structure of those Yukawa interactions from condensed matter theory. Um, and we'll see they also automatically satisfy this anomaly cancellation condition. Then I'll talk about the continuum limit and show you the theory really does uh, target chiral fermions. Uh, I'll make some brief um, remarks about how the sort of simplest model you can come up with automatically connects to the Paddy Salam gut model. And then I'll have a few words to say about possible future issues. So there are a couple of papers out there. One of them is basically a lattice paper. The other one is more in the continuum. So those are the two references. Uh, and there was a whole host of references within those papers to the background literature in various fields. All right, so let's talk about why we might be interested in chiral lattice fermions. So we'd like a non-perturbative definition of a chiral gauge theory, and there are lots of reasons for that. I mean, pedagogical reasons, just as a, we'd like to have a non-perturbative formulation of a chiral gauge theory, just to show that it really exists outside of perturbation theory. And also because there's lots of things we don't know about strongly coupled chiral gauge theories. For example, things like dynamical symmetry breaking, massless composite states, things like that. So the only non perturbative regulator we really know about is the lattice. And so there's been a lot of effort over many years to put chiral fermions on the lattice. Um, and so the, uh, mo the upshot of those efforts has been rather negative so far, in fact. Uh, and, and the reasons are kind of well understood. So this nielsen neomir theorem, which goes back to the early days of lattice gauge theory, implies Basically, you have to start the lattice theory, which is vector-like. You really don't have any option there. Um, uh, but if you start with a the vector-like theory, what you can hope to do is add suitable interactions to that theory, which say raises the right-handed states up to the cutoff. So these are called mirror models, and you can formulate them in the continuum as well as on the lattice, and it's one natural way to go. And it's basically the uh, uh, procedure that's been adopted in all the lattice efforts that have been tried so far whether it be with naive fermions, domain wall fermions, overlap fermions, whatever. Um, and there's basically, in the end, been little success in these approaches. And, and the reason is sort of simple. What happens is that you need very strong Yukawa interactions in the theory in order to do the gapping, to raise the states you don't want up to the cutoff. And that, when you get to these strong Yukawa couplings, typically what happens is you spontaneously break certain symmetries and bilinear fermion condensates form. And those condensates typically couple the left and right handed modes and, and result in a vector like theory again. So that's roughly speaking how most of these formulations have died in various ways. So the proposal um, or the talk today 
we'll, we'll outline a new uh, lattice mirror model, which uses a, a, a reduced staggered fermions. So I'll say a little bit about, at least define what reduced staggered fermions are in, in a moment. Um, we'll attempt to adapt half the states with a particular set of Yukawa cup interactions. And the structure of those, as I said before, were basically is borrowed from condensed matter theory from work by Kateyev almost a decade ago uh, for uh, one-dimensional um, Majorana fermions, uh, non-relativistic Majorana fermions. Um, but we'll find that the model satisfies these uh, certain discrete anomaly cancellation conditions, uh, which have really only been highlighted in the last, say, five years or so. And I'll show these arise naturally uh, from a certain anomaly, which is unique to staggered fermions, and more strictly to Kähler Dirac fermions, um, which are generalizations of staggered fermions that can work on um, backgrounds with non-trivial topology. And that turns out to be important in understanding where the anomaly comes from. That anomaly is actually exact for these fermions, even on the lattice, which is an important feature. So there's, there's no sense in which you have to get a continual limit to see the anomaly. It's there at finite lattice spacing. I'll, sh I'll, I'll argue that after gapping certain of these uh, reduced staggered fermions, the low energy theory becomes chiral in the continuum limit. There's no exact chiral symmetry at non-zero lattice spacing. It's something that is emergent. Uh, and I'll show you perhaps, uh, if I have time, how the continuum theory provides a basically a non-perturbative regulator for the Paddy Salam model, which of course incorporates the standard model. All right, so let me jump right in. So uh, this is the staggered fermion action. So uh, the fields chi and chi bar here are single component Grassmann variables living on the sites of a, say, a hypercubic lattice with periodic boundary conditions. Um, Eta mu are these famous staggered fermion phases. So they're just written in terms of the lattice coordinates. All right, they're just plus or minus one, depending on the xi's, the coordinates on the lattice. And this is a well understood uh, lattice action. It's been, uh, its origins date to the early 1980s. It's used, been used for lattice QCD extensively and still is in various guises. And it's well known that it describes four uh, Dirac fermions in the continuum limit. So I'm not going to tell you where this comes from. You can get it from particular procedure, so-called spin diagonalization applied to a naive fermion action, which is a naive discretization of the usual Dirac action. But I'm just going to jump right in and say this, this is the starting point of the whole discussion. And it's based on these one component fermions living on lattice sites with this particular action. And here's a mass term, which just couples chi bar to chi. So the question, so this describes four Dirac fermions. You can ask, can I do any better than four Dirac fermions? These are what are called tastes in, in the context of lattice QCD. Well, you can if you set mass to zero. So if you look at the massless theory, then this action decomposes into two independent parts, right? Basically, this action couples um, chi bars, say, on even sites to chi's on odd sites, where odd, the parity of the site is just defined here with this epsilon symbol. It's minus one to the sum of the coordinates. So I can divide my, say, toroidal lattice into even and odd sites. And this action couples even say chi bars to odd chi's and odd chi bars to even chi's. So I can simply drop half of this, uh, uh, these components and just keep one of them, all right? So just half the number of degrees of freedom. This get, defines what I mean by a reduced staggered fermion or reduced staggered action, all right? So these chi plus minus is just these projectors, P plus minus act, acting on chi, which is just one plus or minus this epsilon guy acting on chi. And so epsilon is what I will call the lattice site parity. So I can get down to something with only two Dirac fermions by this procedure, but they have to be massless. Of course, if I'm thinking about chiral fermions, that, that's not much of a restriction. That's exactly the restriction I need. All right, so, so let me take our model and rewrite it very slightly. I'm gonna write this, since I only have one Grassmann variable per point now, it's either a chi or a chi bar. Let me just call chi bar plus chi plus, all right? And let me think of n flavors of these uh, fields and write an action uh, of this form. So it's essentially it's my uh, usual staggered action, but now I just have a single variable chi on each site. Um, it has carries this index A, which labels the flavor, uh, and it's coupled through a symmetric difference operator, just like it was before. All right. And here are the same staggered fermion phases we had before. All right. So it's, it's almost the simplest firm, relativistic lattice fermionic action you could think about, right? Single Grassmann per site, symmetric difference operator and flavors in this case, right? massless. So it's invariant under a certain number of symmetries. 
So I can take the chi and I can shift it to a neighbor chi using these phases xi, which are defined. These are sort of analogous to the eta phases. All right, again, this is well known in the, in the staggered fermion literature. There's nothing new about any of this. This action is also invariant under discrete rotations, 90 degree rotations. Those are the analogs of Euclidean Lorentz invariants. It's obviously invariant by construction under some sort of flavor rotation. I can take these chi's and rotate them into each other, these n chi's through some, um, uh, now I'm gonna think of them as some, some SO, some real rotation group. So I'm gonna now think of these chi's as effectively real. Right, so that's another restriction. Since I have only one Grassmann per site, this is, a, this is a natural kind of thing to do. So we can think of them as the analog of a Majorana field um, for, for a lattice gauge theory. So I can imagine that uh, you can ro rotate this under SON rotations, for example. Um, and finally, the thing has an important U1 symmetry where I can take the chi and I can rotate it by a phase, but that phase depends on the lattice site parity epsilon. So you see it's an invariant. So basically epsilon anti-commutes with this symmetric difference operator. And so this is actually, a, even though it's in a, it's the, even though the phase is the same on all the chi's, it depends on, since this, since these two chi's are on even and odd sites, this phase cancels out. That's the way to think about it. All right, so because every term in here couples a plus to a minus underneath, as I just showed you, if you actually un unpack this, it couples a plus to a minus, then these phases come in with equal and opposite sign on the two chi's, and this is a, an exact U1 symmetry of the reduced staggered action. So it's very easy to convince yourself that the, these the symmetries protect the quantum effective action of the theory from any fermion bilinear terms you can think of, whether they be on-site or off-site, right? So once you start with this theory and impose these symmetries, then you can't write down a quadratic mass, a quadratic um, fermion bilinear terms in the action without breaking any of the symmetries. And as I said before, this describes two massless direct fermions, or since I'm thinking these essentially as real, four Majorana fermions in the continuum limit. So that's the starting point of all these constructions is a reduced um, fermion action, reduced staggered fermion action based on some number of flavors of fermions. Simon, uh, there is yep. a question by Shailish. Uh, Shailish sure. raised his hand. Hi, Shailish. Hi, Simon. Uh, so by now, do you understand whether it's S-U-N or O-N? <laughs> I think you, in the simplest models that, that you constructed and that we discussed, you know, a couple of few years ago, I agree that it's in general, it's S-U-N. But since I want to construct, you know, chiral gauge theories here, I want to avoid all the usual perturbative anomalies. So I'm going to restrict my rotations to strictly S-O or spin. Uh but then how can you, how are you allowed to do u1 because that's also a complex so it's, it's it's a funny business it's, i think this is more like what you could so really these so symmetries should be spin symmetries for a start right because they're acting on fermions or acting on chiral fields and i think in fact it's spin c so if you look at spin c it's a combination of spin n cross u1 so i think you know basically i so although you choose these chi's to be real they're not really, of course, in Euclidean space, they're complex. It's just a statement. There's just one grasp and per site, right? right? So I think you still have the freedom, at least in Euclidean space, to do a phase rotation on them and yet impose only an SO symmetry or a spin symmetry. So in the sense um, of global, global phase. Yeah. I mean, it's a restriction. It depends how you write the Yukawa interactions down, of course. It's a, it's a question of the choice of Yukawa's too. So the, okay. the Yukawa's I'm going to use will only inv be invariant under a spin spin four symmetry if you want. Um, okay. But, but you're right. I mean, this is a subtle business that I don't fully understand, but I'm going to make that restriction. If I don't do that, I'll have all kinds of perturbative anomalies independent of the discrete anomalies I'm going to talk about, right? So, so I'm going to try to restrict myself to think of these. It's just like fermions in Euclidean space are all intrinsically complex, but you can still impose effectively a, um, a invariance only under orthogonal rotations. Okay, but, great. Yeah. I, I, I agree, it's a subtle business and uh, you know, we, we should discuss later. But I think it's okay, right? But, uh, right. Uh, Simon, one question. Um, sure. uh, so mass terms are not allowed uh, for this action uh, by symmetries? Not if you, these symmetries protect you against those in the action. It doesn't stop you forming condensates in principle, right? But, but from the point of view of the quantum effect of action, right? Right.
uh, we'll see when we start writing it. So we're going to try to write interactions now for these theories, and that will break this U1 symmetry down to a subgroup. Um, but at the le you know, if I I can avoid mass terms from with the existing symmetries in, that I, I showed you here. Yeah. And I have to be able to do that to have a hope of talking about anything chiral. Hmm. Right. You know? I mean, you can sort of see explicitly, if I put a chi-chi term together, this U1 symmetry breaks immediately down to Z2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. If I put chi's mm -hmm. on separate sites, then typically these shift symmetries are also are broken. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So, um, so th that's the way it works, roughly speaking. Anything I write down which couples chi either locally or semi-locally will break one or more of these symmetries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shall I go on? That's, that's fine. If, yeah, 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 please. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about uh, writing down interactions. And in pra practice, we're interested in four fermion interactions. And so the simplest model, which was a model actually that Shailish uh, came up with, uh, I guess at least five years ago now, um, just has four flavors of these reduced staggered fermions. And I'm going to implement it through a Yukawa interaction, as I said before. So I'm going to couple a fermion bilinear, this one here, to some sort of auxiliary field and then integrate that auxiliary field out to generate a four fermion interaction. So this is the standard hubbard stratanovich business, all right, or completing the square in particle physics. Um, and as before, the symmetry, it has the same symmetries we talked about. It has an SO4 flavor symmetry or possibly SU4 if you, once you've integrated the sigma out. Um, uh, the sigma here, I'm going to take actually to transform in an SO3 subgroup of the SO4. That's a technicality. It doesn't have any great importance here. Um, the U1, of course, is broken down to just Z4, corresponding to taking the chi's multiplying by I epsilon and flipping the sign of sigma, all right? So that's an obvious symmetry of this four fermion interaction. So the U1 is already broken down to a discrete subgroup. We'll see that's a generic feature of these constructions, okay, later on. And it will be important in the chiral context as well. Although it won't be Z4 in that context, actually. Um, all right, but this, this is the simplest thing you, this is the simplest four fermion interaction you could think of. I have four Grassmanns at each, at each site. So the simplest thing is to take a product of all four of them and it's just anti-symmetric by virtue of the Grassmann nature of the chi's. It's actually very surprising that no one considered this model up to, until about five years ago, since it's about the simplest four fermion lattice model you could think about. But for some reason, it wasn't looked at because reduced staggered fermions, I guess, were not commonly looked at uh, for various reasons, which are basically related to QCD and sign problems and things. But anyway, this is the simplest model you could imagine involving relativistic lattice fermions with interactions, okay, and these are the symmetries. So it's easy to show at strong coupling that this uh, four fermion operator condenses. I won't do it, but it's a, a very trivial calculation. And what I'm gonna do is interpret that, uh, the presence of a condensate like that as the presence of a, the, uh, essentially a, a bilinear term, but one which couples an elementary fermion chi to a composite fermion built through the Yukawa interaction, through the four fermion interaction of this form, all right? So I'm just rewriting, thinking of this thing as basically a coupling of chi to this sort of capital, Greek capital pi thing. And so you can see in that context immediately that what one has at strong coupling is a gap symmetric phase. So the fermions acquire masses without breaking symmetries at strong coupling. And in particular, there's no fermion bilinear condensate at strong coupling, right? So, so that's the first point. Um, so I know there has to be at least one phase transition, therefore, as I scan in this four Fermi coupling G, because at G equals zero, I clearly have massless fermions. And I can argue at strong coupling that those fermions acquire masses without breaking symmetries at strong coupling. So at least one transition has to exist between the two. And in fact, it's, this model has been studied in two, three, and four dimensions at this point over the last five or six years. Uh, Shailish started off uh, all of these studies uh, in a, back in 19, 2014 or so, I think. And then various other authors, including myself, have, have contributed at various points to, in various numbers of dimensions. Uh, the transition in three dimensions that I talked about is particularly clear and well understood and has been studied on pretty large lattices. And it looks like it's continuous, but has very non-trivial critical exponents. And so it's very interesting from that perspective. Um, in four dimensions, it, it you can also find a place in the phase diagram of this model where there appears to be a continuous phase transition too between 
massless and massive symmetric phases. Although in four dimensions, you have to also tune a scalar kinetic term to see that transition. And you can argue that just on the basis of simple RG arguments, the kinetic operator for sigma for the scalar field first becomes marginally relevant in four dimensions. Below that, it's irrelevant, and so you wouldn't expect to need it, and you don't. But in four dimensions, uh, you, it appears very important that you tune that additional coupling. I'll show you some results in just a second, just to give you an idea about that. In two dimensions, it's just a single massive symmetric phase, and that's also expected from two-dimensional physics because of Coleman and things like that. So these mo this model, which has now been studied quite a bit, seems to gap all the fermions and yield a massive vector-like theory in the continuum limit. All right, and then you, so you can define a continuum limit because there's a continuous phase transition in the model. So let me just show you some briefly some results for four dimensions. This is meant to be motivating for what we're talking about later. So here's a sort of proxy for the four fermion condensate for different lattice. Oh, this is different values of this. I'm in four dimensions, so I have an additional coupling kappa, which couples to the scalar kinetic term. So it's a strictly a higgs yukawa model rather than just a four Fermi model. Uh, this is a eight to the fourth lattice, I guess. And you can sort of see, uh, if you know, let's just look at the blue and the red curves, those are the most relevant ones. Um, you will see a nice, it's not strictly an order parameter, but you see that the four, this four fermion condensate switches on rapidly around G of one. Associated with that, if I look at corresponding fermionic susceptibility, you'll see a nice peak in the same place. Uh, this is a function now of different lattice sizes from six to the fourth to 12 to the fourth here. So this was worked on with David Sheik uh, and Newman Bott, my student at the time. Um, so you might worry that this saturation of this peak with lattice volume is a bit nerve wracking from the point of view of really being a, this being a phase transition. But in fact, what we find is that the correlation length close to this peak grows very quickly. And in fact, it's even hard to simulate large lattices at this point because the the number of conjugate gradient iterations you need to invert the Fermi operator, which is sort of a proxy for the correlation length, grows so fast. So this is actually more critical than the poor, pure four fermion model at that point, even though we've actually had to tune the scalar kinetic term. So there's certainly some sort of interesting physics here, which has still got to be fully worked out, actually. There's only one numerical paper so far on uh, devoted to this model, uh, and it certainly is worth more efforts. But here, here's an example of a model where we generate a four fermion condensate at strong coupling through what looks like a, a continuous phase transition with a divergent correlation length. In other words, I can define, in this case, a massive continuum for four Fermi model uh, fermion theory without breaking symmetries. So this is the symmetric mass generation phenomenon. All right. Anybody have any questions? All right, let's go on. So it's sort of natural then to push this a little bit further, this idea. So we just showed, I just shown you that you can generally use Yukawa interactions or full Fermi interactions to generate masses for the entire reduced staggered field, the chi minus and the chi plus, chi's on odd sites and chi's on even sites. You might imagine, what about, what about using a Yukawa interaction which just attempts to say gap chi plus? All right, so for example, to be concrete, Here's a, here's a Yukawa interaction you can think about. It's a bilinear in the chi's. I have some coupling between them, which I'm calling gamma here, but this is some bilinear in the chi's. I have some auxiliary field sigma floating around, carrying some index A. Again, let's not worry about that for the moment. But I'm gonna, the key thing is I'm gonna couple them through these projectors, P plus and P minus. So I'll have one coupling capital G to say the even sites, and one coupling little g to the odd sites. All right, and let's assume there are a total of two n flavors here. So this little index A here runs from one to two n, and let's assume the index capital A runs from one to n. So I'm gonna, gonna explicitly assume only a spin or an SOM uh, symmetry, all right? Now, you, so this certainly uh, follows from the, um, this has a structure I said that it only couples strongly, for example, if capital G is much bigger than little g, it only couples strongly to the chi plus. Uh, the precise structure here is a bit, looks a little bit more specific than that, and it is. I borrowed the structure largely from uh, condensed matter theory. Uh, it's from work, for, it's essentially the Kitaev interaction that was written down in 2009 for gapping Majorana fermions, and now applying it here directly on these, in these staggered fermion cases. So in fact, these gammas are really some sort of Dirac gammas associated with an SOM symmetry, all right? This has the, it has the advantage that if I just 
fixed all the sigmas to one, say, to a constant, then you can show this generates a series of degenerate Majorana, two n degenerate Majorana masses for the n flavors of reduced staggered fermion. So I just get eigenvalues of this bilinear, which are plus or minus one, if you want. So it has that. Uh, that's the. That's why. That's what emerges once I use Dirac gammas here. All right. But we're not going to work. I'll, I'll show you how that works better in, as we go along. So at the moment, you could just think of this as a general anti-symmetric real matrix, which couples the chi's. It has to be anti-symmetric because of the Grassmann's, right? Um, and we'll see later that the gamma, the Dirac structure is kind of important too. But I'm certainly not going to specify how many flavors I have at this point. I'm just going to leave that free for the moment. And the question is, okay, suppose I'm successful in gapping just the chi plus fermions and leaving the chi minus massless. What's the continuum theory look like? So that we have to address that. And that's, I'm going to argue it's chiral. And then I'm going to say, what are the constraints on uh, we're going to consider what are the constraints on n, the number of flavors, and possibly even the structure gamma that I talked about before. So this is the sort of a generalization of the, the, the vector-like full fermion model we talked about before. And, and the, get, the aim, aim of the game on the end will be to try to generate a chiral theory by, by um, choosing the structure here, the power structure here carefully. And we'll see there are constraints on what you can do uh, to, to, in order to decouple this chi plus and chi minus. Most. I mean, a quick question. It's always been difficult in the past. Yeah. A quick question. Sure. So uh, I'm a bit confused with your notation here. Chi plus and chi minus. I thought we just ignored everything and just called them n flavors. So are you introducing that concept again? They are now? n flavors, but of course I can still think about just odd sites and even sites, right? Within a single chi field, I can just restrict or I can think about, I can just apply this projector and say, I'm going to use a strong coupling for chi plus ones on even sites and a weak coupling for chi minus. Oh, I see. So within each, the, within the reduced fermions, you're still distinguishing, and I guess this is a local interaction. I see. Okay. It's just a, it's just a fact of the matter of the kinetic term only couples plus to minus, right? Even once I go to a single Grassmann per side, that's still a true statement. Okay. Great. I'm just trying to arrange my Yukawa interactions to pick out, say, the even site interactions different from the odd sites. I can certainly do that. I don't know what, the, at this point, I don't, I'm not sure what the continuum limit will be, but I can certainly try to do something like that and ask what the nature is of the continuum limit. So, so the exactly. P plus and P minus are projections into the each. each. One plus or minus epsilon over two, okay. right? So it, that, right. I can make that projection in addition to call, using a single chi, right? Yep. Sure, yeah, thanks. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excuse, excuse All right, me, so, can I have a question? Sure. Um, so doesn't this projection break any symmetry of the lattice theory? Uh, yes, at this point it will, uh, it breaks some of my discrete shift symmetries, mm -hmm. for example. So if I move, I can't, uh, I can't shift chi to cut to a neighbor chi to a single mm -hmm. link, right? Because I have, I have to have G equals, capital G equals little G for that, right? Mm -hmm. So it certainly breaks that. Um, it doesn't break. Uh, I mean, of course, I've broken the U1 down in the first place, and we'll have to decide on that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but that was true as soon as I wrote four Fermi interactions down as well. Um, um, and let's see. Yes. And, and it also has an effect on Lorentz. You can only do certain types of transformation yeah. on the chi's. That's true. How about the discrete rotations? Yes, right. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So you have to worry about the restoration of Lorentz invariance as well. That's uh -huh. true. I see. Okay. Well, I have to worry about all of that. Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, at this point, it also, to get back to your earlier question, Shailish, um, if you're, these shift symmetries are generally associated with flavor symmetries, right? Yeah. Those are the SU4 flavor symmetries that people talk about in staggered fermions. At this point, since you can't, do general uh, general shifts. I don't automatically restore SU4. In fact, I, you can easily show that um, I restore only SO4, I, or just flavor transformations. So if you want, one of the ways to, to understand why SO is important here is the fact that the shift symmetries are broken down to a discrete subgroup of them, which involve shifts over two lattice spacings, which generate the Lorentz group, the spin group, the spin four rather than SU4 for flavor symmetries. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so anyway, to, uh, to understand what the constraints are and what you can do here, you, it, it, it's important to um, um, sort of generalize the model we talked about a little bit and think about um, staggered fermions on lattices which don't have the topology of the torus. And we'll see then that there's a certain anomaly that arises naturally, and you need to take that into account uh, when you can try to do this gapping mechanism on the torus. So, so you, the way to think about this is the following. Staggered fermions are best understood as a discretization of so-called Kähler Dirac fermions. Um, uh, so there is no unique discretization of these guys, but there's a very natural one that exists on any random triangulation with any lattice topology. All right. So, so, so Kähler Dirac equation fermions are uh, um, uh, an alternative if you want to Dirac fermions. But in flat space, they just become equivalent to four copies of Dirac fermions. So roughly speaking, the, the Kähler Dirac equation looks like this. So there's some kernel K, which is a D minus D dagger, which acts on some object omega to give zero. So clearly, if I square this guy, K squared is minus box. So this is like a natural square root of the Laplacian. So this is the exterior derivative of its adjoint. So since D squared and D dagger squared are nil potent, the square of this guy is basically d d dagger plus d dagger d, which is just the Laplacian. All right. So if you're Dirac, you can think of this as a, you're trying to square root the Klein-Gordon equation. This is one solution to that, which doesn't immediately involve spin, um, Dirac spinners. All right. In fact, it's an alternative to gamma dot d, the d slash. Uh, in flat space, you can show nevertheless that it describes two to the d of d degenerates Dirac spinners. So it's like. Uh, so it's not the minimal solution to the problem of square rooting the Laplacian, but it's one natural solution. And it's one that doesn't necessarily involve uh, spinner, spinners at all, right? So this omega has to be a set of forms because a D acts on forms. And in fact, it's a collection of all forms from zero forms up to D forms on a D dimensional manifold. All right, so it's a very geometrical uh, rewriting of the uh, fermion equation. And, and then remarkably enough, this, this Kähler Dirac equation can be discretized. And when you discretize in a certain way, you end up with staggered fermions. But the nice thing is you can discretize it on various different triangulations, not just regular hypercubic um, tessellations of flat space. And so that we're going to exploit that to see um, what the constraints are. All right, so I'm gonna take staggered fermions off the torus now for a moment. My 16 staggered fields in the unit hypercube become now, as you see, a set of anti-symmetric tensors forms. So this omega is explicitly has a zero form, a scalar, a, a vector form, um, a link field if you want, uh, something living on plaquettes if you want, up to something living on volumes, all right? So I can associate each of these components with particular P simplices in the lattice. So again, this is a, actually a fairly well-known procedure uh, the original staggered operator gets replaced by this Kähler Dirac operator. And in discrete form, I can write this not in terms of D and D dagger, but in terms of delta and delta bar. These delta and delta bar are what are called uh, are boundary or co-boundary operators. So they're the analogs of D and D dagger on the lattice. And they act in, in the following way. If I have a P simplex, which is written as a, a sort of ordered set of P plus one indices, A0 to AP, then when I act on it with a delta, it basically gives me all the boundary components of that simplex. It, it deletes basically one of the A's from the list with an alternating sign, which is related to the fact we, this is defined on what's called an oriented triangulation. And so there's an analog of D and D bar, which are just, they are both nilpotent in the same way and they're nilpotent on a finite lattice, all right? And so I can write down a Kähler Dirac operator, which is based on these boundary and co-boundary operators, which turns out to be completely analogous to the definitions of D and D dagger. So there's a complete mapping of the continuum into a discrete form. It's a theory of what's called co-chains. Um, and if you, on a fixed torus, you can actually make this uh, yield the staggered action. So it's one way if you want of deriving the staggered fermion action is to take, start from the Kähler, continuum Kähler Dirac action and then impose a toroidal lattice regular toroidal lattice and impl implement these boundary and co-boundary operators uh, and then uh, turn the key, basically. So it's completely equivalent, all right? So I can write down a lattice Kähler Dirac equation, which looks like D minus D bar on omega equals zero. These omegas now are, are lattice fields living on p-dimensional simplices and it's some general oriented 
random triangulation. It doesn't matter, right? So unlike staggered fermions, I can look at this equation on any random triangulation corresponding to any curved background space, if you want, and with any topology, right? And there's a theorem that tells you that the solutions of the lattice equation go smoothly into the solutions of the continuum equation one-to-one. -one. So there's no additional fermion doubling here. The only doubling you have when you study the kähler dirac equation is doubling that's there in the continuum. It's precisely the fact that you, in four dimensions, the kähler dirac equation gives me four copies of the Dirac equation, four degenerate copies of the Dirac equation. So it's doubled from the outset, even in the continuum. There's no additional doubling coming from latticization. Right. And it's that four tastes of staggered fermions just, just re-emerges in this language. All right, so uh, this is a very brief, unfortunately, introduction because I can't spend too much time talking about Kähler Dirac fermions, but they're, they, they have a lot of application, of course, in various um, parts of lattice physics, including lattice supersymmetry, of course. Simon, uh, one yeah. question, which I guess no. I'm, I'm not really understood well, but is there any uh, confusion or complication between Euclidean and Minkowski space at this time, or there everything goes? Dirac fermions look more natural in Euclidean space, actually, um, uh, because it, it ends up, one way to, uh, to, to get to the Kähler Dirac equation from the usual Dirac equation is to imagine uh, um, a system with say four flavors of Dirac fermion. And then what you end up doing to get these forms is you end up twisting the Lorentz symmetry with the flavor symmetry. And so it's natural if the flavor symmetry and the Lorentz symmetry are completely equivalent. Um, and so in Minkowski space, of course, it's SO31, not SO4. So there's a, actually, it's a little more awkward to do this twisting procedure in your Minkowski space. So they seem very natural in Euclidean space and less natural in Minkowski space, unless you take a non-compact flavor group. Um, Tom Banks discusses all this in a very nice paper from the early 80s, I think it's 82 or 84, called Geometric Fermions. Um, and so, yeah. So, so I guess the- well, I, we're, we're Euclidean because we're on the lattice in the end anyway. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is not a good time to talk, but maybe during the discussion, is there mm -hmm. any difference between Hamiltonian lattice fermions versus Euclidean lattice fermions? That's my, I guess I might sort of motivation. I thought about there. the Hamiltonian formulation of this. I guess you certainly could do all of this. You could write a Kähler Dirac operator down just for space. I don't see any reason why not. And so you could write down a Hamiltonian version of this story, but I haven't thought about it, Charlie, essentially. Uh, might be nice to think about actually, because it, then you would be able to address Minkowski space directly. Yeah, that's what my goal is. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm talking Euclidean here. I don't see that some of this technology couldn't be employed in in um, in the context of Hamiltonian systems. It might be interesting to think about. I don't think anyone's actually done anything, as far as I know. Certainly not on the lattice. Thank you. Thank I don't you. know. Okay. So let's get back to this business about anomalies. So. So I can write this discrete Kähler Dirac operator down. And, and remarkably enough, it, it exhibits a certain symmetry. So there's a very simple linear operator that acts on these forms living on the P simplices, which just flips the sign according to whether it's a P is an odd form or an even form, all right? And it's easy to show that this gamma anti-commutes with the Kähler Dirac operator, the lattice Kähler Dirac operator. So there's an exact uh, anti-commute. This is, if this looks like epsilon commuting with D, it's exactly, it is precisely the same thing. So I can generate a U1 symmetry of these, this collection of forms, e to the i alpha gamma, just using this anti-commuting property of gamma with k. So, so this is precisely that e to the i epsilon symmetry of staggered fermions, right? So that's the manifestation how it, in, in the staggered fermion realization of Kähler Dirac on the torus, this is this thing, but it generalizes to arbitrary triangulations and arbitrary topologies um, using this more sort of general formalism. So of course I have, so I have an exact symmetry of the massless Kähler Dirac action based on this, uh, um, this guy here. Uh, but of course, if I have symmetries, I should look at the fermion measure and understand whether they su survive into the quantum theory into the path integral. But it's very easy to write down, of course, formally what the, the, the measure is for the fermion path integral. I just have to integrate over all the different forms, right? Living on the sites, the links, the triangles, et cetera, et cetera. So I have N zero sites, N one links, N two triangles up to N four, four simplices in four dimensions. If I do one of these rotations on each one of those omegas, I will pick up some factors 
right? Some phase factors for each of these things. And if you look at it for a second, you'll realize what I pick up is precisely the Euler character, right? So I get N zero contributions plus one, N1 contributions minus one, et cetera, and I get an alternating sum of these Ns. So in fact, the fermion measure is not invariant under the symmetry. In fact, it transforms by a phase, which depends only on the Euler character of the triangulation. So it can be captured exactly by the lattice theory. It doesn't depend on being on the continuum. You can be, it's, it's agnostic as to whether you're in the continuum or not. If I did this calculation on the continuum, it'd actually be much harder. It'd be like the Fujikawa calculation for the ordinary U1 axial anomaly, right? Um, so I'd have to put in a spin connection and, and, and an appropriate covariant derivative and things like that. And I'd end up with something which looks like FF dual, which would actually be more like the Riemann tensor squared or the Euler density strictly. So, but it's much easier on the lattice. You just count, count simplices and you get the Euler number. So if I think about N flavors on the sphere now, the sphere I can think of as a compactification of R4, like normal. The sphere has chi equals two. Um, and so Z will transform for N of them by E to the I two N alpha, right? So it's invariant if alpha is pi over N, right? Now, if I'm to write four fermion interactions down, I require a minimum N of four. I can't do it with three or two, obviously. So I will see that the anomaly cancels naturally. First, first of all, it tells you that, that this partition function will, will be invariant now under a Z8 transformation corresponding to e to the i gamma times pi over four. And the anomaly, if you want, will cancel out in that situation. And notice this is captured. This statement is true directly on the lattice. I don't have to be in the continuum at all, right? This anomaly is realized, if you want, completely, it's captured completely exact, completely um, without error just on the, on the lattice. I just have to be off the torus. I don't see, see on the torus, chi is zero and I don't see this anomaly at all. So it's only visible if you go away from the torus. All right, any, any questions? All right, so let me go on. So let me return to the torus now, equipped with this piece of knowledge and ask, okay, what new Kaur interactions for reduced staggered fermions are consistent with cancellation of this Z8 anomaly? Right, so here's my fermion operator again. It's easy to write an eigenvalue equation associated with that operator. And if I demand it be invariant under Z8, right, where the, right, then I can do a transformation with this particular phase factor. And now I'm back on the torus, so gamma is just epsilon of x. All right, so it's very easy to show that the spectrum of the theory just gets transformed by a phase by this. So I can just operate on this equation with omega, omega and show that there, if you have an eigenvalue, eigenvector phi n, there'll be another eigenvector omega to the minus one phi n with a shifted eigenvalue omega squared lambda n. All right, so the eigenvalues basically shift globally by a factor omega squared under the Z8 transformation. So if I just look at the non-zero modes, as long as my eigenvalues come in pairs of four at least, right, because I have omega squared, the Fafian I get from integrating the fermions is naively invariant under this symmetry, all right? So the symmetry survives into the quantum theory for the non-zero modes for certain. But of course, you always have to worry about the zero modes and treat them differently because the zero modes are not necessarily paired in the same way the non-zero modes are. So, so, and of course, on a torus with periodic boundary conditions, there are zero modes. So let's see what that means. So I'm gonna pick a reference configuration where I set all the sigmas to one. And let's for the moment just set the two couplings equal. So I'm doing a vector-like theory if you want. Um, so if I change the phase of sigma corresponding to one of the omega squared, it's just like rotating the coupling if you want, e either of the couplings by e to the i epsilon times pi over two. So it's omega squared, not omega that rotates the field sigma. Furthermore, I can take the interaction I wrote down there, which was sigma dot um, gamma, I can rotate it using an SO, a non-anomalous SO2N rotation to two by two block diagonal form, just to make life simple, right? Where J is just a bunch of basically I sigma twos down the diagonal with um, magnitudes mu, and mu is just the uh, coupling constant, basically. So the Fafian, this contribution to the Fafian from the zero modes is a product of all over all the zero modes. And if I have both of them in play, G and G, capital G equals little g, then it'd be a product of all, both epsilon plus one and epsilon minus one zero modes, so both types of zero modes in general. Um, there'll be a phase factor that get a factor of 
for each of these blocks, there'll be n blocks, there'll be a factor of e to the i n times epsilon times pi over two. So first of all, the obvious thing to say, state right now is if I have equal numbers of chi plus and chi minus modes, zero modes, then these phases just cancel out. I get an e to the i epsilon and e to the minus i epsilon for each block. And so the Fafian is certainly invariant for a vector-like theory where these couplings are equal, right? But suppose somehow I've managed to gap out chi plus and pushed it above the cutoff. So it's no longer contributing to the zero mode sector at all. Then you see then this product over zero modes only takes say, say epsilon equals minus one modes into account. They're the only surviving zero modes. Then I get a real constraint out of this, all right? Because if I only have the epsilon of minus one guys and I have a positive, you know, this phase adds up, all right? And what you see is that if N is not a multiple of four, the Fafian is not invariant again, all right? So it's the same anomaly we saw before, all right? And you can cancel it as long as you use N multiple of four or two N a multiple of eight. In other words, if you have multiples of eight reduced staggered fermions, this anomaly will cancel out. Right. So I should be able to, I, what I want to do is turn this around and I want to be able to claim that you can't, you will fail in your efforts to generate a mass for chi plus and decouple from chi minus in the continuum limit unless you've canceled this anomaly out in the light sector. So it's like if you want to take your reduced staggered fermion sector and you want to break it into two and push two, one set above the cutoff and keep one set light, then the anomaly has to cancel basically in both sectors to do that decoupling. If it doesn't cancel, then the only option the model has is to form a fermion bilinear, which couples the sectors back again and makes it vector-like, right? So you will certainly, so a necessary condition for you to be able to do this symmetric mass generation for a theory where you have this asymmetric Yukawa interaction is that you are able to separately cancel the anomaly just for the light fermions. So that's the statement. Right. And that, that's a philosophy that's actually, as far as I understand it, um, been propounded quite a lot in the condensed matter literature, in fact, that sort of gapping is equivalent to anomaly cancellation. If you're able to gap the system, then you're able to cancel the anomaly out. So these discrete anomalies have arisen in the, in the condensed matter systems in, in, in a variety of ways, and that's the general statement. So it's not really, it's a folklore that, that canceling anomaly is enough, but it's certainly a necessary condition. All right, so if you ask what's the minimal model I can play this game in, then I have to have eight reduced staggered fermions. They need to be in a real representation of some uh, global symmetry group. And the simplest solution you can come up with, what's the simplest, you know, what is going back to my Dirac structure, what, what's the simplest SO group I can come up with, which has this minimal constraint, it's spin seven. So I can take an eight dimensional real spinner representation of spin, set, of spin seven and use that for my, for my reduced staggered fermions. So, and that, if you do that, you get precisely the Kitea of interaction that was written down in 2009, All right? So he uses precisely an interaction which is spin seven invariant and it's the minimal solution to this constraint. But now we've sort of rewritten it in the language of reduced staggered fermions, that's the idea. Okay, so I'll show you in a moment that this continuum theory actually has 16 vial fermions, at least naively in it. And this also agrees with continuum arguments on discrete anomalies uh, based on the die fried theorem. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of work done in mathematical physics in just the last few years, precisely in enumerating these types of discrete anomalies for fermions. They typically involve introducing um, uh, manifolds with different topology. Uh, but they're strictly in the continuum and they typically have the same constraints, including this constraint that in four dimensions, you need at least, at least 16 vial fermions to cancel these anomalies off. So the argument I gave, of course, is formal. I've just assumed that I can gap the chi plus above the cutoff to decouple it. So you really need to demonstrate this in a non-perturbative context and to tie it to a symmetric mass generation explicitly. And as I said before, it's very likely you'll need a kinetic term for scalars in four dimensions too. So you won't be able to just do it with strictly four Fermi interactions. You'll have to have kinetic terms for the scalars. But anyway, the, the main point is that the, you can understand perhaps some of this, uh, some of these constraints coming from the condensed matter community in the context of these relativistic lattice fermions um, that we're familiar with in particle physics uh, called, called staggered fermions. So the, and you can even understand why the spin seven interaction that Katev wrote down in a Hamiltonian language is important here. 
right? It's sort of the minimal one which allows you to uh, escape this anomaly. Um, so just to show you some, I, I'm, I'm being very bold, I'll give you some very early numerical results just to show you this is not completely crazy. So this is the, this is showing you the four fermion condensate on a, in three dimensions, not four, so I don't have to worry about the kinetic term. So I'm gonna, this interaction that we've written down can be written down in any number of dimensions. So let's just go to three dimensions just to sort of see. Um, so here's my chi gamma chi squared off, um, condensate as a function of capital G. So here the black points show you this rising up as a function of G. The red points are, so this is on the, sorry, this is on the odd sites. On the even sites show you what you get for the even condensate, right? So notice this is a log scale. So the even site interactions, the even site condensate um, is three orders of magnitude smaller over this range of G than the odd. So we can certainly generate asymmetric four fermion condensates. Uh, that's clear. So I'm li taking little G to be 0.01, I'm just scaling big G here. I've even shown you an eight fermion condensate here, which is associated with the anomaly too. All right. So we have to do much better than four cubed, of course, but just to give you an idea, this is written on my laptop in, you know, in a matter of a few minutes, All right? But we have a parallel code now, so we're going to do more serious work with it, but just, this is not, it's certainly possible to generate the asymmetric condensate you, you would like as the start of all these models. So I can potentially gap, gap subsets of the fermions. Um, we also took a quick look at spontaneous symmetry breaking. This is key, of course. I'm, I better not have any or else I'll end up with a vector-like theory. So this shows you the site condensate um, as a function of an external symmetry breaking source. Um, the, there are just two lattices, four cubed and six cubed here. Uh, and you can see that I, I get an unzero verve once I, once I add the external source, but that verve goes smooth, smoothly to zero as I take the source away. There's no sign of spontaneous symmetry breaking, no volume dependence to these curves or not significant. Here's the link condensate even more important because that covers explicitly plus to minus. And again, as I put an external source in, uh, it will in general be non-zero, but as I take the source to zero, it's scaling down to zero with very little volume dependence. So at least on these tiny lattices, there's no indication of spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is at least um, reassuring at this point. Uh, what's even more interesting actually is to look at this, um, essentially this operator I call the expectation value of epsilon of X. It's basically the value of epsilon of X evaluated on the eigenvector basis uh, associated with the fermion operator, all right? So I can look at this, this so it tells me uh, what the effective epsilon is for the modes in the system. So what I see is here's the eigenvalue on the x-axis on this left-hand plot. Again, this is in three dimensions on a very small lattice. Uh, and I've fixed uh, capital G of five here, all right, just to be interesting. So, so what you notice is the following, the small eigenvalue modes, all right, all have typically a negative value of epsilon. The large eigenvalue modes typically have a value of close to one, all right? And in fact, you can see from this plot, which is on a single configuration, that the density of points is much higher up here and down here than in the middle. And in fact, you can see that explicitly. If I look at the histogram of the parity of the modes, I see most of the modes are either plus one or minus one. And as I said before, all the minus ones are typically slow, small eigenvalues, all the plus ones are typically high eigenvalues. So again, what we're seeing is that most modes have epsilon plus minus one for large G, large cow coupling, and the positive modes typically have large eigenvalue, the negative modes are light. So these are the right general features that we are looking for, all right? Admittedly, these are very, very small lattices and I'm only in three dimensions here. I'm not strictly doing the chiral system in four, um, but at least it's sort of, it's encouraging at this point, I would say, All right? So I have managed to separate the modes into two sectors, one of which is positive, one of which has positive parity or the other one has negative parity in the way I would have imagined naively. Any, any questions about that? Okay, well, let me just go on. I'm sure I'm running out of time at this point. Yeah, so I'm not got too many to go actually, so we'll probably just about make it. So let's think about the continuum limit. I showed you I might be able to decouple the modes into two sectors this way, but why is it chiral-like? So the way I would to, to, to argue for that is the following. 
So I take my original staggered fields and I build them back up into a four by four matrix using products of gamma matrices. This is the usual, I guess, spin taste basis of staggered fermions. It's very, very natural in the Kähler Dirac language too. It's the way you would uh, go back to Dirac fermions from these tensors. Um, but I won't say anything more about that. Um, so I can always take my staggered fields and assemble them into a, a sort of a, a, a lattice, a, a matrix fermion, which resides on a lattice with twice the lattice spacing. And it has a block structure and chiral basis looking like this. So all the even sites lie on the diagonal blocks and all the odds parity sites lie on the off diagonal blocks, all right? So providing I re, uh, the exact lattice symmetries are sufficient to recover the Lorentz symmetry times the spin four flavor symmetry. Notice it's just spin four, not SU four here because of the asymmetry of the Ukawa interactions. I, I don't have all the discrete rotation, uh, discrete shift symmetries I start with. I only have a subgroup of them that generates spin four. So basically these operators, by the way, act by left and right multiplication on epsi. So Lorentz transformations act on the left, flavor transformations on the right. If I go to the naive continuum limit, the columns of this matrix give me the continuum spinners. So there are four columns started corresponding to uh, four Majorana fermions I started with. But the real chi, this reality condition, actually implies something else on the continuum of psi. It tells you that psi and psi dagger are related, all right? So psi is equal to gamma two, psi star gamma two, which also relates these blocks. So O and O primed, E and E primed are not actually independent. They are related through a conjugation operation, right? That just comes from imposing this reality condition, which is the statement, basically, we had a single real chi uh, at each lattice site, or, or if you want, yeah. So there's a notion of generalized charge conjugation here, which relates the blocks. So for ordinary charge conjugation, I would do something like sigma two times the fermion psi equals another, the other fermion. That would be the Majorana condition. In this sort of matrix language, you get an extra sigma two associated with the flavor two. Just corresponds to the fact that this psi is not a spinner, but a four by four matrix, a collection of spinners basically. All right, so providing this Lorentz symmetry is restored, and there is a question mark about that, then um, this is the condition. So O and O primed are not independent blocks, two by two blocks, but they're related through a co charge conjugation condition, similarly for E and E primed, right? So in fact, you can write this all out in a bit more, uh, in a bit more detail. So I start off with an SU2 cross SU2 Lorentz symmetry and an SU2 cross SU2 flavor symmetry. I had the Z8 and the spin seven symmetry as well. And if I look at these blocks, this is how they uh, decompose in terms of representations of these first two factors, the Lorentz and flavor factor. So, um, so I get a set of right-handed, so E, the two by two block E contains right-handed fermions transforming a, in the two one representation of SU2 cross SU2 and the two one representation of flavor. Whereas the O block contains left-handed fermions. So things in the one two representation of Lorentz but they're also in the two one representation of flavor and similarly. So if somehow we're able to gap the blocks in E prime, I'm just left with O and O prime, but since they're related through conjugation, basically all the degrees of freedom in the end, if I'm able to gap the theory, reside in the block O. That's a two by two uh, block of fermions, which corresponds to a pair of massless Majorana, or if they're massless, equivalently vile fermions Right, um, and since I have eight of these, because I have eight flavors of reduced staggered fermions, this means that the physical content of the theory, the light theory, is 16, 16 left-handed vial fermions in the continuum. So at least the naive continuum limit tells me that this gapping that I've talked about has a chance of producing precisely 16 left-handed vial fermions, right? Does anyone have any questions? I'm running a little bit late, so I'll, but I'm almost finished. Um, so this magic number of fermions works in other dimensions. So I just showed you that this construction potentially yields 16 vial fermions in the continuum limit. In two dimensions, I can use the same construction. Um, each gap to reduce staggered fermion yields a now in a single Majorana rather than a pair of Majoranas in the continuum limit. So I need four Majorana spinners in total. Um, in three dimensions, of course, chi is zero, so I can replace S3 by the ball, three ball, which has chi equals one. That now has a Z4 symmetry, 
but each reduced staggered fermion has four Majorana fermions in the continuum limit. So with four flavors, I get, again, 16 Majorana fermions. These numbers are all consistent with the arguments rooted in the Nye-Fried theorem and explicit CMT calculations. So it does seem like reduced staggered fermions have the potential to give explicit lattice models that realize these magic numbers of fermions for which this, this, these discrete anomalies cancel out. All right, so that's very consistent with what we know in other contexts. Um, so that's just a brief comment. It's trivial to gauge the spin seven, right? The interactions are completely on site. So there's no problem about gauging those interactions. The problem is always the kinetic operator, right? But I can just gauge it in the conventional way, right? So I can, if what I'm saying is true, I should be able to produce a, a theory, uh, a chiral lattice gauge theory in the continuum limit, right? Um, so the gauging part is trivial. Once I can conserve the global symmetries, gauging the, at least the spin seven part is straightforward. Um, if I could, so this, uh, so now I have an interesting additional comment. If I, as I, I'm able to higgs the spin seven down to spin six, which is the same as SU four, say by imposing condition sigma a squared as one, right? Then the Fermi representation, the eight breaks into a four plus a four bar. That's just standard group theory. So that means I, if I started off with a theory which had fermions which transformed in the eight, two, one, so the O block basically contained um, a pair of fermions, here's the two, um, transforming in the uh, eight dimensional representation of spin seven. If I do this Higgsing down to spin six, that breaks into a four and a four bar, and I can always write the four bar as a right handed state. But when I do that, I'll flip the flavor representations too because of this generalized charge conjugation. Right, so I end up with a theory which has an SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2 uh, continuum symmetry, and these representations 421 plus 412 in the right representation right, and right handed fermions, these are the matter representations in the symmetries of Paddy Salam, uh, which is a well known grand unified theory written down a long time ago, which contains the standard model. So the construction I talked about potentially uh, can be connected to the Paddy Salam model. Um, and hence even to the standard model, all right? And it's just following from these general constraints on anomalies. Um, so let me summarize, and I'm only a minute or two late. So I've told you that, that reduced staggered fermions with um, you, special Yukawa interactions may allow for a chiral continuum limit. It requires ma symmetric mass generation, which is a non which is non-perturbative physics. I don't know how to get at it without doing lattice simulation. But it's certainly a necessary condition to make this work. And this is a realization which is, uh, uh, well, it was new for me anyway, is that you have to cancel these discrete anomalies. If you don't cancel the anomalies, you have no chance of making these mirror models work, right? They may not be enough, right? But it's certainly, uh, the cancellation of the anomalies may not be enough, but it's certainly a necessary condition. Um, and I show these, how these arise in the context of this discrete model. Um, Cancellation requires eight reduced staggered fermions or 16 valve fermions in the continuum. And this agrees with known results. You can gauge the spin seven symmetry and therefore produce a lot chiral lattice gauge theory in the continuum limit. Um, and you can even connect to Paddy Salam. Um, and of course, a lot of work has to be done to check whether this really works in four dimensions by direct simulation. And there you may run into a sign problem, right? There's no guarantee you don't have a sign problem here. We have not seen a sign problem in the small simulations we've done so far, unless I take extreme values of G, capital G, but you know, maybe you will need to be there in the end at, in, on larger lattices. So I don't guarantee you can do this by Monte Carlo in the end, sign problems may be a real issue. So these models just allow you to interpolate from a well understood relativistic lattice model where you know explicitly what the exact lattice symmetries are and talk about uh, the um, a, a chiral model in the continuum limit. And so they give you an ex seem to give you an explicit way of getting a handle on the connection between the two things. So people have discussed continuum theories and discrete anomalies in the continuum. Um, there's been a lot of work on in condensed matter physics in terms of writing down non relativistic hopping models and things like that. Uh, but there's no, this model allows you to interpolate between those two different, um, different realizations uh, and, you know, in a language which I, I think is uh, more familiar to particle physicists uh, than the condensed matter language typically is anyway. All right, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Simon, for a very interesting talk. Uh, actually, there is uh, one question 
hmm? uh, from the audience. Uh, this is your Proko. Can you ask a question? Uh, yes. So, uh, do you have comments about the generalization of these two, let's say, uh, 10, 10 dimensional large n matrix model? Uh, no. I mean, one thing, I mean, if you, are you thinking about like an SO10 model or something like that? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So clearly SO10, by the way, has a 16 dimensional representation. So it would satisfy these anomaly con cancellation conditions. So I could, instead of, I gave you the minimal solution, which is to take an eight dimensional representation of spin seven, but I could take the 16 of SO10. Um, and so certainly that model will be completely consistent with what I said. Um, but I haven't thought about large N at all. I mean, remember this is, uh, um, the first thing is you need to have SO symmetries, not SU symmetries. That's, a, that's an important constraint. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right, so, okay. So I'm thinking aloud here. Um, so I'm not quite sure which model you're thinking about in, in detail, but... Um, uh, like a I type type 2B matrix model. Huh? Uh, type 2B matrix model, IKKT model in particular, for yeah. example. Well, I don't know how, the problem is that's generally formulated in terms of an SUN um, symmetry, right? It has yes. SO10 Lorentz well, symmetry, but it has an SU, um, right? So that, that, so, and I, of course it's a zero dimensional model. So I, there are no perturbative anomalies in the usual way, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure here. I mean, I, I have to be very careful here, right? I'm, I'm telling you about these new discrete anomalies, but of course I have to make sure I cancel out all the usual anomalies too that arise you know, from the triangle diagrams, which means, and one simple solution to do that is just to take SO symmetries, right? So then I know the model is free of those guys automatically. Mm. And uh, so, but yeah, I don't, I'm not quite sure because you're, you're in zero dimensions. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Normally, picture really fits into that, but I, I think you certainly one one simple statement is that you can certainly swap spin seven for SO ten if you want. If that helps, mm. that would certainly be consistent. Mm, I see. Thank you. Okay, uh, Haddad, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my question is really more general. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I have skipped a lot of technical uh, details you have talked about, but uh, what about the gravity side of uh, this model? Can we conclude to, are you projecting to, to have any, any quantum well, gravity I, result about I all don't that? know how to put, oh, well, let's see. You saw that the anomaly we talked about was basically a gravitational anomaly, right? It came from formulating the model on a curved background, okay, be it the lattice in this case, right? And so you only saw the anomaly in that sense as a, um, as a result of coupling to gravity, but it was sort of a background field. Right, we weren't thinking about integrating over, um, you know, the the gravitational field in the path integral. So it's strictly a non-gravitational theory. But you can sort of see, you know, there are connections to gravity. The constraints are coming if you want in the continuum from gra coupling to background gravity. So it's a it's a gravitational anomaly, I think, in this Kähler Dirac picture. Um, uh, I'm more thinking about uh, holographic duality, not in the right. Um, well, of course, and there are, I mean, if I, if I work in odd dimensions, then chi is zero on the sphere, at least, as I said. But of course, I can then imagine tailing interactions which um, apply in the bulk, right? For where there's no anomaly, but would leave a boundary free. Um, and so I could certainly think about a sort of bulk boundary correspondence. And in fact, that is discussed in the condensed matter literature not in this language exactly, but, but that kind of idea is, is discussed. So there might be ways to understand holography here um, because one of the, the nice things about being in odd dimensions is this anomaly actually vanishes, but it doesn't vanish for the surface states, right? So the boundary of a, so for example, I could take, um, yeah, actually let me back up. Suppose I don't work on the sphere, but I work on the ball then the boundary of the ball is precisely an even dimensional sphere, right? So I could imagine tailoring four Fermi interactions that apply in the bulk, which, which vanish on the on boundary and leave you massless states on the boundary where those states are then constrained by the anomaly. So there are, there are ways to think about holography, but I haven't really spent any time on it. I mean, maybe there's some way to, to 
tie it all together. Um, Got it. Thank you. Uh, Salish, uh, would you like sure. to ask a question? Yeah, hi, Simon. Um, hi. So just wanted to understand a bit more about the Yukawa model that you talked mm -hmm. about. So I could, I guess, take the small g to exactly zero yeah. and then tune the large g from zero to large values. Mm -hmm. And then I think what you're telling us is that most likely there will be a second order transition or something I like that think so. we, we haven't seen it so far in these small lattices actually uh, I, but uh, I, that was my original thought was there will be a, some sort of second order phase transition ideally where you could think about a continuum limit right yeah, but but that's the that's the kind of continuum limit you're imagining i guess right right by the way i don't take little g to be zero exactly because it's an exact zero mode if i do right oh. because i can do shifts on the odd site fermions Right. And mm -hmm. if there's no Yukawa interaction, those are exact symmetries. And so you literally have to regulate that zero mode somehow. So you put a non-zero little g in, but you expect it to go to zero in the infrared because it's an irrelevant operator weak coupling, right? But but you could take anti-periodic boundary conditions everywhere, I would think. Absolutely. And in fact, that's what we do to, to yeah. remove that zero Then mode. I don't understand your zero mode. At least in the four fermion limit, it should be at least in the G very large, I can use this fermion back trick and see that you do get a massive phase. And at G equals zero, you can show that, of course, you have a massless phase. Right. So there must be a transition between the two. So I don't quite, I, I, think, I think you should be right. able to do it in the fermion bag language, I would assume, maybe not. I, I think that's right. And, and I, that's what I was anticipating and still am to some degree. There will be a transition if I go out to strong enough coupling. Um, okay. All I'm showing you at the moment is that on the path to that, we already have the right general behavior. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what I've showed you is if you want perturbative at the moment in capital G, even though the... Yeah. So, so remember we had this conversation, I guess, with Chinke Shu and all these people yeah. about uh, doing, with, doing all these with domain wall fermions. And we were always sort of yeah. imagining this need for the second order transition. Is there something that is now beyond that need for a second order transition or is still need that for a continuum limit? I think to take a talk about a continuum, you probably need the second order phase transition probably, right? I don't see how- Because that... if, you, if you think in this domain wall language, right? So you have chiral modes to begin with and their goal was essentially that you give masses to one side of the domain wall in this way, right. whether the other side remains massless and if you naively at least think about it, there was at least this discussion suggested that you didn't even need the second order transition because all you needed was a phase where the other side became massive. They just want to gap the other guys up to the cutoff. They don't even care about them. Exactly. So uh, I guess you're not, you're, your well, approach is not like that at the moment. Or No, I'm, I'm not sure you couldn't blend this with a domain wall kind of approach too and try to separate the modes in, in addition spatially. It's not clear to me how those two ideas, you know, um, whether you know whether you need a domain wall approach to make this work or not, whether you can do it directly in the bulk, which we're doing here. I see. Okay. I, in fact, I talked to David Tong about this, and he's very unclear too. He is also working on a domain wall approach, and we discussed a bit about this stuff and oh. staggered fermions. And I don't know whether he's using staggered fermions at the moment, but. But he said he was very unclear about um, whether you really strictly needed the domain wall structure or not, whether you could work directly in the bulk. Um, I, I guess it's, uh, he wasn't even clear how the two things, which one was necessary <laughs> in the continuum even. Um, so I think it's all really unclear, Shailish, actually. And, and it would be interesting to think more about it. And one could imagine coming up with an analog of what David Kaplan did and, and trying to separate the chi plus and chi minus modes for starting from a Kähler Dirac type of action, right? Mm -hmm. I think you could play the same sorts of games. There might be a technical advantage to that. It's sort of also a bit related to what I was saying before. You know, if you take an odd dimensional system uh, with a boundary, so a ball, you can imagine, you know, using four Fermi interactions in the bulk to gap out the bulk modes and leave sort of massless states on the boundary. And those massless states are still constrained by the anomaly because they correspond to things with, to a boundary with the topology of a sphere, or you could choose 
other kinds of topologies too, right? Mm -hmm. So it's possible you could come up with a model which starts from a from odd dimensions, from say five dimensions or something, and and choose you know choose four Fermi interactions in the bulk which leave massless states on the boundary, and those are still constrained by the same kinds of symmetries. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought it through, but it, it does seem like there might be a way to have both kinds of uh, ideas simultaneously in play. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's it's all. A, I think the main thing is to realize that, the, that the, these rather mysterious anomalies that the mathematical physics people, the string people, are talking about, might be rather simply understood uh, in terms of this sort of funny, twisted U1 symmetry that arises in Kähler Dirac fermions, and we're mm -hmm. seeing a sort of shadow of that in staggered fermions in terms of this U1 epsilon. Yeah, yeah, that connection was very interesting. That part, I think, is robust. Exactly how you make your model and whether you need to be in even or odd dimensions or seems to me still up for grabs. It's not clear to me that what I've given you is the best way to do it. I, I think the more important perhaps point is just to emphasize the, the existence of a rather unique you want symmetry, which is not there for Dirac fermions, but is there for Kähler Dirac or staggered. Uh, and it's essentially gravitation and our origin, uh, but which is exact on the lattice. That's the that's the key thing. And so you can say make exact statements about that um, at non-zero lattice spacing, and, and and somehow that's important. Satisfying that anomaly is is one important constraint on constructing any kind of model involving chiral fermions in the continuum. I think that's the maybe the take home. I, sure. Yeah. I thanks. think that's robust. Um, the rest of it might be arguable <laughs> um, yeah it'd be very interesting to understand this in better detail i think but uh, and, and by the way the continuum people as far as i understand their papers at all and i don't really understand them at all the string papers they're all talking about using uh, manifolds with very with different topology to pick out these anomalies so it has that in common with it right yeah. but i don't understand the language they use in terms of borders and groups and stuff like this i don't understand any of that this is much more of a poor man's <laughs> approach. Okay, uh, Atish, do you have another question? Ah, no, no, sorry, I forgot. No, okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, Simon, can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, I assume that you don't have any sign problem in the vector-like theory, but once you make yeah. this projection, there will be a sign problem, right? Yeah, we have, we've, we're looking at the Fafi on these small lattices and it's okay at the moment, but if I go to very strong coupling, I see it. So to get back to what Shari said before, right where the phase transition occurs, there may be a sign problem. In fact, that's likely a sign problem, I would say. Uh, so you everything's, have a sign real, everything's real, so it's just plus minus one, but it's there. Uh -huh. So you yeah. have a sign problem also in three dimensions. And do yeah. you do some re relating to take into account this sign? No, what I showed you, uh, there is no sign problem in anything I showed you numerically. I but see. I have done some, uh, we have pushed up to a strong coupling where uh -huh. there looks like there might be a transition maybe, and there, there's, there's definitely a sign problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, I, I mean, maybe this is the death knell for Monte Carlo methods in the end. Um, you might need to, you know, maybe you need uh, Shailish's kinds of uh, fermion bag things. Or maybe you need a quantum computer or something, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I talked to Yannick actually, and that was his immediate thing he took off. He said, "Oh, this is a great motivation for quantum computing." Then, <laughs> um, but not not in not probably in my lifetime. <laughs> so I hope we can make a bit of progress with Monte Carlo, but um, I, I am suspicious that chiral fermions in general probably involve a sign problem. You would have guessed so, unless we were very, very lucky, right? That was the general feeling. Sure. Sure. Are there any other questions? Well, um, so can I ask another question then? Oh. Um, yeah, well, my biggest concern is the breaking of Lorentz symmetry. And yep. do you have any hand-waving argument that uh, well, so, the symmetry can be restored. So I think it's restored on the lattice with twice the lattice spacing. So at the moment, I can't do no. If I can't rotate chi plus into chi minus 
you know, um, because I've got chi, I'm treating chi plus differently from chi minus, but of course I can do rotations on twice the lattice spacing still. Uh -huh. So I think, um, so that's one point. So uh -huh. it's not true on a single lattice spacing, but it is on a two lattice spacing. The second is that the model, the final model, I don't really care about rotation, rotation invariance for the, for the gap states. They live up at the cutoff and I don't care what their symmetries uh -huh. are ultimately. Uh -huh. And the symmetries I'm interested in are the ones associated with the light states, right? Uh -huh. now, the light states are only weakly coupled. Mm -hmm. So one would hope, guess, <laughs> that restoration of rotation invariance for those guys, Lorentz symmetry, would be more automatic because it's the usual mm -hmm. arguments that are used in staggered fermions for rotation for restoration of continuum symmetries. Right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're basically weakly coupled arguments. Right? They use asymptotic freedom, basically, to, for in the case of QCD or something. Mm -hmm. But here, the chi minus states are all basically free theory. It's a free theory, right? Until you gauge the spin seven, it's a free theory. So I would have guessed you're in much better shape for the states you care about than for the states above the cutoff, which I ultimately don't care about if I'm if things work out. So that's one thing I would say. I think it was actually on one of my slides, but I didn't say it. Um, but you know, there's a lot there's a lot to be understood about that. I I do agree that there are things that could go wrong, which is a which is a breaking of Lorentz symmetry. That happens, then sure, this works, but then the identification of chiral fermions doesn't work, right? So there's a chance you construct a lattice theory which gaps half the states, but it has nothing to do with chiral fermions because you never restore Lorentz symmetry, even for the weakly coupled states. That that would be one possible way things could go wrong. But I'm somewhat optimistic because I think the states I'm interested in are basically free. Uh, and I can I can write down discrete rotations acting just on those states, uh, which ought to give rise to continuum Lorentz symmetry um, automatically. One would think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, let's thank Simon again.